Hello and welcome to the Comic Cave. I'm Ramsey, aka Captain Away, and today I'm looking at the 2011 to 2015 series Superman, part of DC's The New 52. As the oldest super-powered superhero in the world, you can imagine that Superman has gone through a lot of changes over the years. In the years leading up to Flashpoint, Superman was killed, got a number of pretenders to his name, was reborn with a super cool 90s mullet, married his longtime love interest of Lois Lane, and even saw the return of many of his fellow Kryptonians. When DC rebooted their entire timeline into the New 52, it's not surprising that Superman received multiple titles to reflect his selling power on the shelves. During the New 52, we could see Superman headlining his own comic, Action Comics, Superman Unchained, Superman Wonder Woman, and Batman Superman. Not to mention, of course, being a primary member of the main Justice League title. But as with most every other character during the New 52, we would also see some drastic changes to Superman's history, as once again, DC attempted to reinvent their flagship character for his 70th straight decade of publication. So let's see just what that all entails and go ahead and take this away. The comic opens on The Daily Planet, the newspaper that Superman's alter ego, Clark Kent, has long worked for, as it gets destroyed. But it's okay, there's a new one. That's right, just kicking things off with a very literal metaphor of going from the Superman of the previous DC Universe to the Superman of this DC Universe. And much like the fans were probably not super happy about that, Superman isn't super happy about losing the Daily Planet. Get it? It's like metaphors on metaphors. It's metatastic up in here. The replacement Daily Planet is due to the paper being bought out by Galaxy Communications, owned by Morgan Edge, who rebrands the two companies as the Planet Global Network. Yeah. That doesn't sound ominous at all. Though I guess it doesn't matter, as Edge will almost immediately stop appearing in the issues and most writers will seem to forget about this even happening. Almost the entire first issue is just about changes to the Daily Planet, like how Lois is now a producer for one of Galaxy's news broadcasts. But we do also see Superman fighting a big fire guy who comes out of Metropolis's new Astrodome. Wait, Metropolis has an Astrodome? <sighs> copycats. There's only one Astrodome, and we all know where that is. H-Town, baby! It takes until the last couple of pages for the issue to even reveal that the reboot completely undid the relationship between Superman and Lois, with them having never formed any kind of intimate relationship at all. And Lois is even dating this guy Jonathan Carroll now, though don't worry. Future writers will also pretty much immediately forget about him, too. Clearly, Clark is still pining for Lois, though, as I guess DC figured fans would like nothing more than seeing these two crazy kids fall in love all over again. I mean, it's worked so well for Marvel every time they've split up Spider-Man and MJ, hasn't it? Hasn't it? Hasn't it, Marvel? Hasn't it? We also don't learn that his parents are dead until issue 3, as in this new continuity, both parents died before Clark even came to Metropolis, leaving him without their sagely wisdom and advice. More or less. But yeah, it's clear this comic isn't interested in moving very quickly. The only thing I learned quickly from this comic is that there's a list of things I'd like to see Superman writers stop doing. And that list is as follows. Look up in the sky faster than a speeding bullet, more powerful than a locomotive, able to leap tall buildings in a single bound, looks like this is a job for Superman, Great Caesar's Ghost. Actually, that last one can stay. I mean, that one's pretty fun to say. And all of these examples come from only the first volume, but don't think that means they stop at the end of the first volume. They're happy to keep those going. But while I may make fun of it, the writing for this first volume, done by comics legend George Perez, he of Judas Contract and Crisis on Infinite Earths fame, is actually mostly pretty strong. The first three issues all more or less stand alone, each focusing largely on Superman's supporting cast while he also deals with different robot villains, before coming together for the remaining three issues with those robot villains making a duplicate evil Superman 
Superman that's creating so many problems that Supergirl even shows up to fight him. It turns out that the alien robots were built from nanobots Superman accidentally picked up on Brainiac's ship, at the same point that he picked up his snazzy high-collared Superman armor suit. Originally, he was running around in a t-shirt and jeans, if you can believe it. There's not much more going on with that, but I thought it was important to mention because a huge amount of Superman's New 52 story revolves around Brainiac. There's also apparently a completely unimportant thread of Lois Lane seeming to figure out that Clark is Superman, but once again, later writers seem to just forget all about that. It literally never gets mentioned again. Volume 2 introduces us to Hellspawn, who was actually originally a villain created by Jim Lee for his Wildstorm universe. But those comics were merged with the main DC universe during Flash's cosmic run in Flashpoint, so he makes his big DC appearance here. He's established as being the prince of the Daemonites, but he kept interrupting the Queen's super fun parties with his morbid proclamations about how their species was dying off and everything was ending for them and blah 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 these scientists and their global warming, am I right? So to punish him, his mama the queen grounds him for 4,000 years. On Earth, obviously. But as spoiled princes will do when being unfairly punished by their parents, who just don't understand, Hellspawn just gets angrier at the injustice of it all, and also luckily gets more powerful by discovering something called the Blue Flame, that gives him his awesome flaming head. Cause flaming heads are cool. Remember that, kids. Superman and Hellspawn more or less fight, but Hellspawn just ends up flying away, because apparently he wants Superman and Earth to live, as the metagene that creates superpowered people could one day prove to be the thing that saves his race. I mean, he did say his race was dying off 4,000 years ago, so it kind of seems like they might already be dead, but sure, yeah, let's go with that. I mean, it's not like it matters, because as has very quickly become the theme of this series, later writers will completely forget about this character, and his entire characterization will be left to be resolved in a couple issues of Red Hood and the Outlaws, which is just about as low of a point as a character can possibly sink. Superman will also briefly fight this vanishing alien assassin guy with alien dreadlocks who is totally not Predator. <laughs> it's alien versus Predator. You get it before moving on to a story about a thief who is only trying to steal something that actually belongs to her and automatically phases out whenever anyone tries to touch her. Which is bad news for the new 52 Superman because he has a tendency to show up and just immediately start punching things with blatant disregard for anyone else around. There was even a part earlier where he came smashing through an office window supposedly to save people from the supervillain attacking them, but come on. There's no way that glass didn't go flying at super dangerous speeds and cut slash and stab those people. The main part of this story is actually about a blogger who is obsessed with Superman having a secret identity. An idea that apparently most people consider to be utterly ridiculous even though, like, where do you think he goes for most of the day, every day? But who mistakenly believes some other poor innocent sap is actually Superman and ruins the guy's life by broadcasting his phony evidence on national TV. This will be followed by the Hell on Earth Super Family event, which I covered earlier this year, so I won't really go into it here, other than to say that during this time, Superman seems to very suddenly get really tired of GBS news and gives a big speech about truth, justice, and the American way, more stuff we've obviously never heard in a Superman story before, and then quits his job and storms out of the office. Cad Grant, society writer who for some inexplicable reason has long been super into Clark, is the only other person who quits with him, despite his big who's with me moment. Awkward. Cat suggests they start up their own news blog, since those were all the rage in the 2010s. They call the company ClarkCatropolis.com, a name so bad they even felt the need to have characters point out how bad it is, but they still go with it anyway. And the company is simultaneously depicted as being so small it's run out of Clark's apartment, mostly just by him, run out of a tiny rundown office somewhere else, and running out of a huge and gorgeous and clearly expensive corporate office with tons of employees depending on what day of the week and who's depicting it at the time. The successful version supposedly happened due to them breaking the news about Superman and Wonder Woman's relationship, which is a thing that happened during the New 52. I know it's not mentioned at all in Wonder Woman's comic and is barely mentioned in this comic, but, you know, 
it's there. Even this depiction of the blog offices only actually happens in the comic that focuses on them dating Superman Wonder Woman. Also, Superman's dating of Wonder Woman makes Clark's continued pining for Lois kinda gross. Not to mention the fact that this undercuts the development of the Lois-Clark relationship that was clearly intended to be the main focus of Clark's personal life for this series. But I kinda doubt the super duo were originally intended to end up dating during the New 52, and that probably came along later. Anyway, at this point, Lois starts investigating something called the 20, a group of 20 people who disappeared after that Brainiac attack I mentioned earlier. Brainiac attack. The 20 turn out to be a group of people who have developed psychic powers for unclear reasons, and Lois's investigations lead her to a senator named Hume who might be their leader. We never find out, really, because he blasts Lois with some psychic energy, sending her flying out of a skyscraper. And he never appears and is barely even mentioned again. Again, super helpful. Lois doesn't end up dying here either, she just ends up in a coma, which is when the comic briefly remembers that Jonathan Carroll was a character. Oh, how nice for him. While Lois was doing her investigation, Superman found himself caught up in it all as well, due to the outbreak of a psychic war between the Hive Queen, a revamp of an old villain here reimagined as the daughter of Brainiac, though she's also not really his daughter, but I guess it's not important, and Hector Hammond, a Green Lantern villain who has been being studied at Star Labs in Metropolis. The comic spins like five issues building up the confrontation between these two villains, and then it doesn't end up happening because one of the 20 grabs something called the Medusa Mask. And obviously the Medusa Mask amplifies the guy's psychic powers. I mean, Medusa was well known for her psychic powers and not for turning people to stone by looking at them, obviously. This guy calls himself Psycho Pirate because he's a psychic and, um, pirates are like, cool. According to my internet's research. And after totally destroying Hammond and the Hive Queen in a battle with barely a thought, he reveals to us that the 20 are all locked up in the Hive. Except that we've seen a bunch of them running around, so are they locked up or are they running around? Then Lois shows up in a weird psychic projection form because apparently she has psychic powers now, and together with Hammond and the Hive Queen who have for no reason whatsoever decided to help, they all work together to stop Psycho Pirate. And then Superman just rips the Medusa mask off and that ends everything apparently. But Lois has used her psychic abilities to figure out Superman is Clark Kent, and begins visiting him psychically, interrupting his alone times with girlfriend Wonder Woman. Then, even though she's just an incorporeal psychic, like a projection, Superman decides to fly her back to the hospital, because we needed him to be in place there to hear General Lane, Lois's father and major Superman opponent, confess to Coma Lois that he's no longer a general and has accepted an appointment by the president as a temporary replacement to Senator Hume, who I guess is dead or something. Clark decides to break this news story on his blog because apparently he learned nothing about the dangers of sensationalist blogging from that story earlier about the guy whose life was destroyed by a sensationalist blogger. In keeping with the obviously vastly more important tradition for this series, I'm sure the writers had completely forgotten about that story. All of this is just leading up anyway to the biggest crossover yet, called Doom which sees the return of Doomsday and Superman being infected by a virus that starts turning him into Doomsday, and also the big return of Brainiac. Brainiac attack. And that's about all I'll say for now because I'll probably cover that story in a few weeks. So I guess I will point out that by the end of the story, Lois loses her psychic powers and memory of Superman's secret identity. How convenient. So believe it or not, that already brings us to Volume 6, which is written by Jeff Johns and drawn by John Romita Jr. Almost as if, six volumes or 32 issues in, DC decided that maybe it was time to get serious about delivering on their main Superman title. This story starts, as so many do, with a giant alien ship attacking Metropolis. Superman fights the alien controlling the ship and finds himself getting unexpected help from another superpowered person. This will turn out to be Ulysses, the last son of Earth, essentially. 25 years ago, Ulysses's parents were scientists looking for a peaceful world in an alternate dimension when they accidentally unleashed energies that would destroy the lab they were in, and potentially the whole world. 
very irresponsible sciencing. Thinking they were doomed anyway, they sent their son in a rocket to a planet in another dimension, where some aliens found him and raised him as their own son. The planet was apparently the peaceful paradise Ulysses' parents had been hoping to find, except for this one guy, Cleric, the big alien from the beginning, who showed up causing all kinds of trouble. Eventually, he managed to capture Ulysses and take him to his home world, which Ulysses had believed to be destroyed this whole time. Now that he's on Earth, Superman finally has a peer. Well, you know, except for his girlfriend Wonder Woman and all his fellows in the Justice League in Supergirl, but who needs those people? So the two start hanging out a lot, with Superman showing Ulysses all about being a super dude on Earth, and we learn that Ulysses' parents are actually still alive. This also introduces for us a bunch of plot threads we won't see an end for, like this villain, the machinist, who can create little mind-controlling bug robots, but he'll never appear again, or this creepy guy that is watching all of Superman's moves on a bunch of monitors. We won't get a resolution to this until well into the DC Rebirth, but I'm sure everyone will remember him from here, right? I mean, this is a Jeff Johns comic after all, so, you know, it's a big deal. And a JR Jr. comic on top of that, his first comic he did for DC. Though, I do have to say, I know he's a popular artist, but man do I hate his art. All of his characters look like blockheads from Gumby. Anyway, surprise surprise, Ulysses turns out to be a bad guy. I'm sure nobody saw that twist coming. Cleric was actually his papa, and apparently every decade or so, they kidnap millions of people from another world, bring them back to their world, and use their energies to reignite their planet's core. Wow. That's... that's insanely evil. I think it's that insanely evil so that they can just blow up the planet and will not feel that bad about it. Yeah, they kidnap a bunch of Earth people along with Superman, who can't defeat Ulysses because Ulysses just absorbs radiation, so he just absorbs Superman's attacks in order to power himself. They then bring all those people to their dying planet, but since Ulysses' birth parents are among the people, he decides to work with Superman to find another solution. But for some reason that I'm really not clear on, this immediately causes everything to simply explode, including the planet, and that kills the billions of people that were living there. But see, mass extinction of billions is okay because they were planning on killing millions of humans, so, you know, karma. All the people that were on the ship, Superman and Ulysses, all get immediately returned to Earth. Not sure why, but if they could do that, why didn't they just do that for all the aliens too? I don't know. We skip over all story and plot at this point so we can have lots of fighting between Ulysses and Superman. Despite knowing that Ulysses absorbs radiation, Superman continues to use the radiation from his heat vision to attack Ulysses, but that energy just instead grows and grows until Superman literally explodes, destroying everything in a quarter mile. Even though Ulysses' power is to absorb this kind of thing, he doesn't absorb this attack and is instead defeated by it. Very consistent logic. This new ability of Superman's they'll take to calling a super flare, and it depletes all the solar energy stored inside his cells at once to just send him up like an atomic bomb. This has the extra effect of making him basically human for a day, and he finds he enjoys living life as a regular person, so much so that he keeps setting off his super flare for no reason whatsoever. Probably killing tons of innocent bugs and birds and stuff, and potentially releasing massive amounts of deadly radiation, but who cares about that stuff? you know? When his powers start coming back, he doesn't immediately get up to full strength and speed, and so someone is able to get a picture of him in mid-transformation between Superman and Clark Kent, and then uses that to blackmail him. This person, who calls himself Hoarder Root, although I seriously read it every single time as Hodor, and I will never be able to shake that and will probably accidentally call him that plenty in the future, is also blackmailing several other people of power. So Superman, with help from Jimmy, Lois, and one of Hodor's people, track the blackmailer down and try to stop him, but he keeps using his knowledge of Superman's identity as leverage over Superman. So Lois decides to just announce his secret identity to the entire world. What? No, seriously, what? He wasn't even in that much danger. That was your best solution? Wow. Superman tries to stop Poe, or 
Star and destroys his facility with a solar flare. But after he does, someone walks by and seems to steal Superman's energy or something. Whatever the guy does, it prevents Superman from ever really truly powering up again. Instead, is just kind of a normal, mostly super guy. He continues to try to hunt down Hoarder, where he encounters this guy who apparently is a professional fighter at some underground super fight place. We never see those in comic book universes. The fights are run by a person with the freaking awesome name of Scheherazade, and they actually are intended to reenact ancient Korean myths, which is honestly actually really cool. Scheherazade wants to hire Superman for the fights, and he agrees because then he'll be able to buy a lot of tacos. Okay, actually, it's because he wants to be able to learn about the guy who was working for Hoarder, but I just really enjoy the taco line. Who doesn't love tacos? All of this is just intended to build up to not one, but two more major crossovers. So while the comic doesn't strictly end here, I'm going to stop here because I'll cover those crossovers in their own videos. So for now, let's just get to the breakdown. I can't believe how little focus DC decided to put on their main Superman title for the New 52. This series ended up being just as much of a mess as so many other of the era, with its constantly changing creative teams bringing inconsistent depictions of the characters and world building. I'm sure it didn't help that they had to spend so much effort making sure it stayed consistent with other Superman titles, and that was probably especially hard trying to stay consistent with action comics, which was set, at least initially, five years before for this series. The highest point of the series was definitely the Ulysses arc, but it still has a lot of problems and is inconsistent enough with the rest of the series that it honestly functions best as a standalone graphic novel, which DC even seems to practically admit in the fact that they remove any sort of volume number from the collected edition, despite the fact that all the previous volumes have definitely very prominent numbering, and DC even starts the numbering over again on the following two volumes, as if the series was a brand new series now. It's like they didn't want this comic associated with the rest of the chaff. Which, fair enough, but also that's kind of mean to all the other people who made comics for you there, DC. So I'm giving this a series recommendation level of... low. <laughs> I'm sorry, but even if you're a big Superman fan, there's so many better Superman comics out there to read, and there's even better New 52 Super Comics to read. So I just wouldn't particularly bother with this one. The collected editions get one, Kryptonite, five Ulysses logos, and two Superman shields. That's moving from bad to good, but not judging anything too harshly, really. So that breaks down like this. Volume 6, of course, shines brightest, not just collecting the best story, but also collecting eight issues and a ton of bonus covers, sketches, and other art. The final volume, the second of the ones that are numbered volume 2, collects the most out of all of them, with 8 issues, an annual, the DC Rebirth Superman issue, and it still somehow finds room for a massive bonus cover gallery. I mean seriously, check this out. This is just the list of bonus covers included here. Volume 4 also collects a lot, with 8 issues, an annual, and a few pages of bonus art, but it collects such a bad story that I couldn't in good conscience rate it as high as the 6th and 8th volumes. Everything else is either 6 issues and a small amount of bonus art, or 5 issues and a good amount of bonus art, except the 7th volume, Before Truth, which only collects 5 issues and 3 bonus covers, so I guess I'm counting a little harshly against it. Brainiac Attack. Thanks everybody for watching, I hope you're ready for lots and lots of Superman, cause that's pretty much what I'm planning on covering for a little while here. I'll probably take a short break in June to cover some comics that are kind of, I don't know, water themed or summer themed or something, I don't know. And then I'll probably end up jumping back into some Superman stuff. There's a lot of Superman comics. If that sounds exciting to you, and I hope it does, then make sure you click the subscribe button and that like button so you can be sure to be here next time, and I hope to see you then, right here in the Comic Cave.